Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center here at the University of Sydney. And I acknowledge the land on which the university is based it's, uh, and its original owners, its current owners and its future owners. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jean Huang, who's from the School of Law, to um, chair the session, the roundtable session discussing uh, the Beijing Olympics. It's very like to thank all our participants before I start. Uh, it's been uh, uh, a very interesting uh, event to bring together. Over to you, Jean. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much for everybody you tune in at this lunchtime. Um, Beijing will organize the 24th Olympic Winter Games, officially starting tomorrow. Uh, actually, if you follow the game, the game of curling already started. Um, Beijing will also host the 13th Paralympic Winter Games in March. This is very exciting. And I actually already marked my calendar of some of my most favorite games. However, this Olympics is also hosted amid the pandemic and surrounded by some concerns and controversies. And today we are very honored to have four distinguished guests to explore the political, public policy, law and economic implications of these Winter Olympic Games. We are going to compare these Winter Olympic Games with last year, the Tokyo Summer Games, and also more than 10 years ago, the 2008 uh, Beijing Summer Olympic Games. Now, let me introduce our distinguished guest. Our first speaker is Professor Tim Harcourt, who is an industry professor and chief economics from the University Technology of Sydney. And our second professor is Professor Deborah Healy, uh, who is a director of the Herbert Smith Free Hills China International Business and Economic Law Center at the University of New South Wales Law Faculty. Our third speaker is from Japan, the Professor Keiji Kawai, who is a professor of sport law at Doshika University, Tokyo, Japan, and our last speaker is from China, and Professor Yang Pei, who is a leading sports law expert in Beijing Normal University. Thank you very much, our uh, distinguished speakers. And today we are going to organize this webinar in a roundtable format. The purpose is to encourage discussion and debate on four important issues. Boeing Court, COVID-19 control and the law reform. And the last one is economy development. The reason why we put the law and economic development at the end, not because they are not important. It is because we would like to focus on the consequence or the future impacts of the Olympics. Um, however, Boeing courts and COVID-19 issues, you know, one is the background and the other is the current very important issue for China. And actually COVID is a very important issue. You know, several weeks ago, um, the incident in, in, uh, in Melbourne in the Australian uh, Tennis Open. Okay, so um, I do not want to waste any time. Let's go into our first topic, um, which is the Boeing courts. Um, I would like to bring a comparative study starting from the 2008 the Summer Olympic Games and today the change of the geopolitical atmosphere. So on one hand, China and the US can see themselves as competitors for the world leadership. Um, on the other hand, the IOC president Thomas Bach has said the Olympic Games are not about politics. So I would like to ask the Deb, what we can learn from the history of Olympic Boeing courts and their impacts? Thank you, Jane. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and to um, address these issues. 
And as you say, the IOC has a non-political approach to all this. It said quite recently that the event is all about bringing young people together and about unity, and it always aims to be non-political. The issue of boycotts is very interesting. Boycotts of the Olympics are not new and they're not unusual. The, the current boycotts described as a diplomatic boycott, and in practical terms, this means that diplomats and politicians will not go from countries such as US, Australia, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, and a number of other countries in support of the Uyghurs in China. But I also note in today's press report, there are some 46 visas that have been issued to people from the US State Department. Um, on the other hand, also, there are 32 national leaders, including Vladimir Putin, who are still going. So how does a boycott happen? Well, national Olympic committees decide whether or not the athletes go. And that was interesting in Australia prior to the 1980 Moscow Olympics. Um, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, said Australia would boycott the Olympics. And then the Australian Olympic Committee said, well, no, we're not going to boycott. And in fact, you can't tell us to do that. Uh, so ultimately, the athletes were left to make up their own minds whether they went or not. Many went, some didn't. Those that didn't were paid large sums of money by the government. And looking at other boycotts, the best known boycotts are probably those in Moscow in 1980 and Los Angeles in 1984. But there were boss boycotts in the Melbourne Olympics in 1956. And 29 countries boycotted the Mo Montreal Olympics in 1972 when the IOC refused to sanction New Zealand for sending teams to South Africa in the apartheid era. And um, the, the IOC did this in defiance of a UN call for a sporting embargo. So there have been lots of boycotts before. They're not new. Do you remember all of those? It's debatable, I think, whether they achieve anything. The South African boycott over apartheid is probably an example of a boycott which was successful if there's such a thing. But it was accompanied by train sa trade sanctions and there was universal um, sanctioning of athletes who actually went there, including some Australian cricketers who went there on a rebel tour. And the Australian captain, Kim Hughes, was sanctioned by Cricket Australia over that. So, um, but, but those, and also those were athlete boycotts. Certainly boycotts by non-athletes are not likely to be as effective as boycotts by athletes because they're not so in your face. You don't see them as much. Um, so what is a diplomatic boycott? Well, a diplomatic boycott's really a sign of disapproval of certain behaviour by another government. But there's an argument also that diplomats miss the opportunity to engage their counterparts on controversial issues and advance agendas by not attending. And this has been recently said by an IOC member, Lord Sebastian Coe from the UK in an article in The Economist. So those are a few thoughts on boycotts, the history, the likely effect, and I'm sure others have things to add to that. So thank you, Jane. Thank you very much, Deb. You know, what you said actually reminded me uh, one of a historical documentary about the, you know, the several boycotts you mentioned. I think one point made by that documentary is the person really suffered is the athlete because the athlete's life, you know, actually is not that long. If you, you, you miss one Olympic and then you miss it, it will be four years, a um, very important part of the life. Um, but I fully agree um, politicians, they may have their very important point to make. Uh, another issue regarding, you know, the political background is, you know, from my legal perspective, is actually before the Tokyo 2000, uh, 2020 Olympic Games, the IOC extends opportunities for athletes to, you know, to, to make their expressions during the Olympic Games. So my question for you is, what are the obligations of athletes around the issue of political comments? Well, it's interesting that you raise it and you raise those changes, Jean, because those requirements have been incredibly strict. I mean, I've been looking at these issues since the 90s and have had to explain them to athletes and to sporting organisations and sponsors. Uh, and they have 
significantly relaxed only last year. Rule 50 of the IOC Charter places strict limits on the rights of athletes to engage in their own personal advertising around the Olympics and also to engage in demonstrations or use of political, religious or racial propaganda. So that's all banned at any Olympic sites. And bylaws to that particular rule provide that a person or delegation who breaches Section 50 may have their accreditation withdrawn and also suffer other sanctions. But political demonstrations also have been uh, long standing in, in Olympic Games. Perhaps one of the best is the, um, the demonstration by um, Smith and Carlos, US athletes in Mexico City after the 200 metres final where they gave the so-called black power salute. And that also involved Australian silver medal winning sprinter Peter Norman, who actually was never selected by the AOC again after he stood in solidarity with them. So these things can be very tough on athletes and the punishments are very strong. So the IOC made clarifications ahead of Tokyo. Athletes are now allowed to speak up in news conferences. They can speak on their social media accounts or protest on the field before a competition, but they are not allowed to express themselves politically on the, me on the medal platform, on the medal podium. So they were made, those changes were made following an open letter to the IOC just before the Tokyo Games urging the IOC to have stronger commitments to human rights and social justice and social inclusion. Um, and those people who made those arguments said that to deny the right to protest was really to silence an essential part of those athletes being. Now that's not to say most athletes don't generally support um, Rule 50, but they think that it goes too far. So in Tokyo, there was more flexibility allowed and the US athlete Raven Saunders was one example. She raised her arms over her head in a cross in a protest about the intersection where all oppressed peoples meet and also a shout out to all black people and the LGBT community. And surprisingly, the US Olympic Committee supported her in that as an as a expression of racial and social justice. Gwen Barry, the US activist athlete, didn't face the American flag as the anthem played. I don't know that that ended so happily, but I'm not quite sure whether she was sanctioned or not because it was on the podium. And an American fencer did the same thing as Saunders. Um, and both of them had previously been sanctioned, put on probation for bending the knee and um, raising their arms. So those things are all background to what's happening in China, to the Olympics in China. So how will it play out in China? Well, I suspect China won't be concerned about athlete protests at the games as long as they don't focus on issues that are sensitive to China. If they focus on other issues, it will be left to the IOC to deal with them. Um, China's recently warned athletes about violating Chinese law at the Olympics. And this has highlighted concerns around the world about China's restrictions on political expression. And that's because the laws on political expression in China are stricter than in other countries. So it really remains to be seen what will happen if a foreign athlete challenges the Chinese restrictions by making comments on Chinese domestic policy, for example, or supporting a particular ethnic group. Um, one suspects that at the very least that person will lose accreditation and be sent home immediately. But whether Chinese will actually apply the force of the law, I think depends on what is actually occurring and what's said. Only time will tell, I think, whether China will be prepared to apply its more restrictive laws in such a high profile international event to a foreign athlete or official. So I think I would leave it there. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, actually, you raise a very interesting issue, you know. Uh, actually, I'm not sure um, because China generally, you know, it imposes very strict internet censorship. So I'm not sure whether in the Olympic village or, or the stadium, they will also impose the, the same standard of very restrictive political censorship on the internet or uh -huh. yeah. 
there have been some complaints about uh, under the under the um, host contract, um, Beijing or the Ch China are supposed to give them free access to the internet and um, and there should be free media, et cetera, et cetera. But there have been some complaints already about um, restrictions imposed on the media and lack of access and you know intermittent access to the internet, which have been reported. And not surprisingly, I would think, but uh, it will be interesting to see what people say when they come home about what actually happened. Thank you very much, Deb. And also related to the geopolitical issues. Actually, if we look at the history, um, consider the sports diplomacy and the ping pong white jiao certainly is so important. It's a highlight, a breakthrough, you know, to reestablish Chinese relationship with the United States. So here I would like to go to a team, you know. Um, could you illustrate, can sports diplomacy provide a benefit that the conventional diplomacy or international trade cannot? And also, do you think these Winter Olympics can help is the you know the, the very tension between China and many other countries, especially China and Australia. Thanks for your question and th thanks for having me. Um, it really is a tale of two Olympics in a way. Um, I was at Beijing 2008, and uh, Kevin Rudd, then the Prime Minister, launched my book on the eighth, the eighth, 2008, at Business Club Australia, which was a, a diplomatic schmoozing club that we set up uh, to get trade and investment benefits from the Beijing Olympics. So at that time, the Australian-China bilateral relationship was at its peak uh, in terms of economics and investment. And we'd uh, basically seen, we saw sports diplomacy as part of a way of comprehensively widening and deepening the relationship. Uh, in fact, um, if we go before Beijing, we go back to Sydney, 2000, we ran the Business Club Australia, a catamaran in, in Darling Harbour, and we basically got together all the international investors from Japan, from China, from Korea, from Brazil, uh, and the IOC and the Olympic uh, host organising committees together uh, to basically schmooze and do business. And uh, there was one famous occasion where a Sydney architect was sitting next to the Beijing organising committee on the night at which Kathy Freeman did her famous race and won that uh, great gold medal that Raleigh Ball called a great relief and a great triumph for Australia. And they bonded quite well at that, watching that race, because it was quite a remarkable day, uh, evening. And as a result, when they went to Beijing to bid for the uh, architectural project for the, um, for the swimming, uh, swimming uh, construction at Beijing, they won. And, and, and invented or created the water cube. So we actually found using the Olympic Games, hosting it in Sydney, knowing that it was gonna go on to Beijing in eight years time, an important arm of diplomatic relationships. And it was relationships that were separate to formal trade relationships. They were separate to formal investment or government to government type diplomacy. Uh, they, they added just a, a new, new dimension and we thought, you know, if you can bring people together for a sporting event, um, you know, there may be some business spin-offs. And I think we saw around a 1.7 uh, billion addition in trade and investment from, uh, from the Business Club Australia concept between, between Sydney and, and Beijing. It's quite different now um, in the sense that we have had a, a frostier relationship, uh, no pun intended because of the Winter Olympics, but also the Winter Olympics is uh, economically smaller than the, the Summer Olympics. And uh, Beijing's very proud to, of course, be, be the only, only city to host both. So it's a lot, a, lot, a lot smaller scale and Australia doesn't have the massive team that it has at the Summer Olympics. And because um, there's not quite the uh, same delegation of Australians going to, to Beijing, I think uh, sports diplomacy will be a little bit smaller at the Winter Olympics. Um, but anything that uh, gets countries together uh, on a different stage, I think, can have some benefits. Um, I was really interested in Deb's summary before about um, the Moscow boycott. There, there were two things I remembered. One was that um, Malcolm Fraser, then the Prime Minister, had asked the athletes to 
uh, boycott, um, despite what the Australian Olympic Committee had said. And then I think some journos went snooping around and found that Malcolm Fraser was exporting wool from his property in Nareen to Russia or to the Soviet Union. So uh, I think some athletes weren't very happy about that. Uh, and, and secondly, it is true the Olympic movement tries to keep out of sport, but uh, when you go back to 1936, you can see how Adolf Hitler used the Olympic Games for his purposes, and it, you know, it took Jesse Owens' athletic triumph to, to quell some of that, uh, that use of diplomacy. So I think, um, I think Deb's right. We have to be aware that even if the Olympics have, has the intention to keep it outside politics and about young people coming together and competing, there will always be, you know, some sort of undertone because, you know, we're we're crossing international borders. Thank you very much, Tim. You know, yes, we people, you know, actually really uh, amid the pandemic, we have people across the borders, you know. So let's move, you know, suddenly to our second topic, which is COVID-19 control. Um, we know that uh, in the past two years, China has responded to the pandemic with a very strong, strongly enforced policy of zero tolerance. Um, even when many countries, especially many English speaking countries have given it up, for example, Australia. So my question actually is, uh, how will the Winter Olympics manage COVID-19? Here we have people travel across the border. Also today from the ABC News, I know that you know the recent uh, small case in, in Tongo actually is due to the cross-border transport of cargoes, okay? So the question is, will this impact China's zero COVID policy? Uh, please, um, Deb, uh, we would love to know your opinion on these very important issues. Thanks, Jean, and, and I don't mean to monopolize the, um, the agenda at this point, but it will move on. Look, um, I think that China will hand, handle COVID control over the Olympics very well. They're able to mobilise large numbers of people very quickly and efficiently. Um, they have said that it will be a safe, safe streamlined and splendid global event in, in their uh, press releases. But what you're looking at is you're looking at some 3,000 athletes, trainers and support staff coming to China. So they'll be placed in a closed loop systems with tighter restrictions even than they had in Tokyo. Not all athletes are in the same loop and there'll be little interaction between loops. Apparently there are two main loops. Uh, vo volunteers went into the closed loop several weeks ago. Um, and as for volunteers, there are two groups of workers for every venue and they will all have regular temperature checks. The loop is closed to the general population. They have specific trains allocated to the loops. Um, and the rules about how COVID, um, COVID isolation, et cetera, will be conducted are contained in IOC playbooks, which are available on the IOC's website for athletes, officials, and the media. And the approach is slightly different depending on the role of people. But all participants in the Olympics have to be vaccinated or they had to come 21 days earlier to quarantine. Uh, there'll be no foreign spectators and Chinese spectators can't buy tickets, they'll be hand-picked. The focus is really on hygiene, risk minimization and minimization of physical interaction. And all athletes must be insured from when they leave home to when they return home, which is the usual, but they have to be insured for COVID, which would be interesting. Um, how will it work in practice? Well, athletes who are close contacts will be able to continue to compete subject to twice daily testing, which sounds practical to me. Um, athletes who test positive and are asymptomatic can come out of isolation once they've had two negative tests. Athletes who are positive and isolated who are really sick get sent to a special hospital. Um, if role, rules are broken, there can be warnings or withdrawal of accreditation or temporary or permanent exclusion from the games, financial sanctions for athletes and teams. So it's a pretty full on system that the Chinese are running. So how do I think that it will impact on COVID zero COVID policy. 
I think it depends on what happens with numbers. In one sense, it may hasten the decline of zero COVID policy if the numbers become greater. Although I, I, I hasten to add that China is in a different position to many other countries on this, the sheer numbers of people in the country and the fact that they've been COVID zero for so long means there's the possibility of enormous numbers of infections overwhelming its medical systems and the domestic supply chains for essential items like food, et cetera, if COVID zero policy is abandoned too soon or quickly. They must do it eventually. It may be gradually released. It's hard to say when that will be. Maybe this will be a leverage point to change the way things are done. Others may have other views on that. Uh, so thank you. Yes. Uh, oh, can I just add a couple more things? Sorry. I should say COVID will really impact Olympic sponsors in terms of the return they get for the large sums they pay for the privilege of sponsoring. It'll impact the athletes because there's no spectators. It will impact the organisers in the sense that there'll be far more planning and implementation to do. And it will impact significantly the volunteers because they'll have really hard work to do and very little of the camaraderie and celebration that usually goes along with volunteering at the Olympics. So. Yes, thank you very much, Deb. So actually COVID-19 control is not a unique issue for, for China Winter Olympics. Last year, um, we, we look at uh, Japan, the Tokyo 2020 Olympic game also confronted with the issue of COVID-19 control. Uh, a particular issue is some public protest actually against the games. Now let's go to our professor KG, you know, will you please share your insights regarding how last year a Japanese government to manage the games and at the same time and deal with the COVID-19 issue. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, my answer might um, deviate uh, a little bit from the uh, purpose of your question. But I'd like to talk about it from the perspective of good governance of uh, organizing committee here. Um, two months before the Olymp uh, Tokyo Olympics was held last year, uh, public opinion poll con um, concluded, um, uh, conducted by a major newspaper, revealed that 80% of voters in Japan were against hold the game. Despite this, Tokyo Olympics Organizing Committee almost did not discuss whether to cancel or hold the games. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to explain why the voice of majority was not fully reflected by the organizing committee. The organizing committee has a total of 45 board members. Moreover, all of these members were appointed and none of them were elected. There were a number of prominent people, including business executives, celebrities, um, politicians, and former Olympians in the board, but it's unclear why and by what process they became board members. Here is the episode related to the appointment when the former president of the organizing committee resigned due to his sexist comment. He was also criticized for his back, uh, back room appointment when selecting his successor. Let's take a look at the Sydney Olympics in Australia. In 1993, the Sydney Organizing Committee for the Olympics Game Act was established. The act clearly stipulated in detail the um, election of the board members and their powers and responsibilities. The chairman and six directors out of 14 were to be appointed based on the recommendation of the state premier and so on. On the other hand, in Japan, no such law has been enacted. There was no specific law to clarify the election process and responsibility of the board. Far from being a democracy, it was a closed and unclear process. This was a different was uh, Australia, okay? I'll go back to the original point. Due to the pandemic, 
the majority of Japanese people called for cancellation of the game, but their voices were not heard. Why is that so? First, the board member did not necessarily represent the interest of the people. Secondly, according to the host city contract, the IOC has the authority to decide on the cancellation of the game. For this reason, the president of organizing committee, the governor of Tokyo, and the prime minister of Japan did not take the initiative to decide where to hold the game or not. They took the position that they had no authority to do so. The learning experience we had from Tokyo Olympics is that the concept of good governance had not been working well, especially under the urgent situation like COVID-19 from the prospect of democracy. It is very ironic, but uh, if the organizing committee was a democratic organization, the Tokyo Olympics would probably not have been held last year. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, KJ. So if we do a comparative study between um, good governance and China games and the Japan games, so one, you know, significant difference is what we heard from China general publics are mostly they are very positive to welcome the games. They all seem that there is no, no you know, at least no heard concern about how the COVID-19 will impact on the China's, you know, zero tolerance policies. Um, from one media, I see, you know, um, the organizing committee in Beijing actually suggest uh, the Beijing residents, if you had a car accident, unfortunately, with, you know, Olympic, you know, um, um, cars or, or, or traffic, you know, please leave the traffic scene as soon as possible. Do not, uh, you know, get in contact with each other. Um, as Deb said, you know, um, it actually depends on the time. Um, in the future two months, you know, uh, we can see how the games, the cross-border movement of people and also the goods, how that may impact on China's zero tolerance of the COVID-19. Okay, now let's move to our third topic, which is the interaction between the domestic law and international law. Actually, as um, KG just now mentioned, the, the organization, how the organization has been elected, um, whether the governance of that particular committee demonstrated the dem democratic uh, principle is important to the whole impacts of the games. Um, here, I would like to go to Professor Pei. Um, we know that last year, Chinese legislator proposed a very important and comprehensive amendment to Chinese sports law. Can you briefly illustrate the major contents of this amendment, its background, and also its implication, especially consider the Winter Games? Thank you, Pei. Okay, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Uh, about six years ago, I lived in Sydney for about uh, three months. I have many fantastic memories in this period. So today is the last day uh, prior to the opening ceremony of Beijing Winter Olympic Games. It's my honor to be invited by the China Studies Center of the University of Sydney to discuss legal topics on Beijing Winter Olympic Games with experts from Australia and Japan at this webinar. A lot of thanks to China Studies Center, Professor Davy Goodman and Professor Jing Huang. Uh, the first topic I want to discuss is revising the sports law of China. Um, in last year, China national, uh, Chinese National Congress published the revised draft of sports law of China. Uh, this is the first time, uh, the first time for this law to be revised substantially since it's coming into force in 1995. The draft has 11 chapters uh, containing 109 articles, uh, which double the number of the current sports law. It should be noted that the term sports defined in China's sports law includes both sports and physical education. 
So China's sports law is a comprehensive legislation covering uh, social sports, competitive sports, and the physical education in schools. Um, well, for the, for the time limit here, I just want to mention several important uh, revisions of the draft. Firstly, and uh, national fitness. Um, the revised draft provides that one purpose of the legislation is to promote building a sports power and healthy China. The draft recognizes the citizens have rights to participate in sports activities equally, and it changes the, the chapter title of social sports into national fitness and provides that the state implements the strategy of national fitness. Secondly, on physical education in schools, recent years have seen the decline of Chinese youth physical quality. Against this problem, the draft confirms that the state gives priority, uh, gives a priority to develop youth. Okay, so there may be some tech, you know, technical issues, but you know, let's move to Professor KG. Um, we understand that the gender issue is a very important, you know, legal issues, um, actually not only legal issues, some health, public health issues as well, discriminations issue as well, because especially we consider the transgender issues recently become a hot topic in the United States. Um, so would you please share some insights regarding how Japan deal with the gender issues in the Olympic Games? Okay, thank you. I'd like to share two, I hope there's like a topics and a story that happened uh, during this, you know, the Olympics. Uh, one is about the sex, uh, sexist comment by uh, the made by Yoshiro Mori, uh, the former president of the Tokyo Organizing Committee. At the JOC, Japan Olympic uh, Committee meeting, he jokingly said, the meetings in which women participate will be longer. In view of Mr. Mori's personality, such a comment itself was quite imaginable, but uh, he was criticized for not understanding the Olympic movement, which advocates gender equality. And he was forced to resign as a president of the, uh, the organizing committee. There were twists and turns in the uh, appointment of the successor president, but in the end, Seiko Hashimoto, a former Olympian, and he got, uh, she got uh, the bronze medal actually, and politician replaced Mr. Mori as the president. The title of the female politician and the former Olympian were considered necessary and appropriate to dispel the image of the organizing committee as a male dominated and closed society. Another one that happened was the composition of the board members in an effort to increase the number of female board members from 20%. 12 new female board members were appointed, bringing the total to 40%. This is my personal impression, but a series of revisions was merely for the sake of building up their image. So, they seemed superficial. My answer to the question how to address with the gender issue in Olympics is that the organization committee had to promote the o Olympic movement since it was of their obligation. So they sometimes dealt with the, it the superficial. However, the Tokyo Olympics became a good opportunity for society to think about the gender equality deeper in, in in the same time. All right, thank you. That's all from, from me. Thank you very much, KJ. Yes, gender issue, you know, is so controversial. Um, you know, um, if we, you know, consider the Peng Shuai incident, you know, it, it will really further politicize, you know, the gender issue. Um, now let's go back to um, Professor Pei. Uh, I, I think you. I think there are maybe some tech issues, you know, with Professor Pei. Uh, we are going to deal with that later. And um, now let's look at the economic impacts. So just now, actually, we, you know, in our 
first two topics we already considered um, some economic impact, for example, the COVID-19 control, the closed loop. So there is not many audience, right? Uh, especially international visitors. Um, the, the protest, for example, in Japan, you know, and the postpone of the games, which all have significant political impacts. So my question for, for Tim is, are there economic benefits to hosting the Olympics or similar events? So this, I think for many Australian audience, actually they are interested because we are going to host the Olympics soon in Queensland. Uh, exactly right. We've got to uh, Brisbane, following on from Sydney 2000 and Melbourne in 56 when it comes to the summer, summer games. I don't think we'll be hosting a winter one in a, Australia unless Tasmania wants to do it or Canberra, but I think summer is where we're at. It's interesting with the economics of the Olympics. Um, most of the benefits are thought to be, um, of course, the broadcast rights, the ticket sales that you, you, that you share with the IAC, but also tourism and trade, jobs in which you invest in infrastructure. And also some nations see it as a way of improving their brand for tourism and international trade and consumerism. Uh, for instance, Seoul in 1988, as South Korea was moving out from a dictatorship towards democracy, saw the Seoul Olympics as a great way to highlight the great work that South Korea had done from being a country that was poorer than Africa in the 50s to an OECD country that eventually uh, became. Uh, Beijing itself in 2008 saw it as a, a showcase of uh, technology and uh, the great innovation in pulling so many millions of people out of poverty in China. Um, so in, in some ways, it's a, it's a showcase. But um, there have been difficulties uh, on the cost side, as well as the benefits. Um, uh, Oxford University did a study of all the Olympics, and uh, with the exception of Los Angeles, they've, they've all blown out in terms of cost. Um, one reason is, is that uh, people uh, underestimate the infrastructure uh, investments they're going to have to undertake. Um, at one stage, there was this uh, beauty contest bidding stage where uh, each country, each potential host city would try and impress the IOC delegates by giving them more champagne and more fancy hotel rooms and, and show brand new stadia and brand new infrastructure to, to try and outbid other, other cities. And so we found that uh, in actual fact, uh, particularly with the, the Rio Olympics in 2016, and also the Winter Olympics in Sochi in Russia, uh, enormous blowouts in, in cost to the tune of, uh, I think it was 50 uh, billion um, US dollars in, in Sochi and uh, 20 billion in, in Rio and protests and a, a fear that uh, uh, the Olympic, the, 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 the cost of hosting the Olympics games was just too much on the community. And in actual fact, uh, historically, Montreal uh, had such a terrible fiscal impact from its Olympics that um, uh, it caused great controversy for Montreal and then it enabled Los Angeles uh, in uh, 1984 to actually renegotiate on pretty favourable terms with the OAC because they were the only bidder and actually make a, a, a profit, which uh, you're not supposed to do with the Olympics, but in, in, in LA they did. So um, there's been a series of reforms with the Olympic movement now. Now the uh, ISC, rather than having a fancy bidding process, just allocates cities. So we have now, say with summer, we, we have uh, Paris and LA and then Brisbane. Brisbane had no competition. Uh, the Olympic movement and the IOC doesn't want to have these bidding processes. They want to have cities that already have the infrastructure in place. And so that there's no white elephants. You don't have stadiums that are never used again. They want to have Olympic villages that will be used for university accommodation. Uh, they want to have um, cities that use uh, green technology and environmentally friendly type of infrastructure. So um, the Olympic movement is actually having to reform itself because in some ways uh, hosting the Olympics can be quite unpopular. Um, when you have a, a less democratic regime, it's a little bit easier because uh, if the leaders decide to host it, they host it. But countries that have to answer to an electorate uh, have to be a little bit safer with, uh, with the costs and with the economics of, of the Olympics. With, um, with the Winter Olympics, it's 
on a smaller scale, I was having a look at the, the budgets for Beijing 2008 and Beijing 2022, and it's around uh, 4 billion US for, uh, for the Winter Olympics compared to almost 45 billion for the Summer Olympics, so more, more than tenfold. So it's on a much smaller scale. And uh, in some ways, I think, because uh, as Jean mentioned, you're not going to have international tourists, you're not going to have international diplomats. Most of the Winter Olympics has been focusing on uh, giving domestic tourists in China what they want, uh, domestic winter sports fans in China what they want. Uh, for the regions of China, mountainous regions in the north of China that, that has winter sports, they've been really having their infrastructure beefed up. I think uh, the Chinese government said they'd make uh, 800 uh, ski resorts by the time of this Olympics, and I think 654 ice rinks, the Global Times said. So they've really tried to put a lot of infrastructure, a lot of pump priming into the impoverished regions that are susceptible to, that are, that are, that are going to be more enticing for, for winter sports. So I think with the economics of it, I think people are wary that there are a lot of costs to putting on the Olympics. Um, there are benefits that some economists think um, are, are dubious. They think a lot of the tourism would have happened anyway. I think for somewhere like London and Paris, they're always going to get tourists. So I think it's not as important for them to hold an Olympics. Uh, and uh, as Jean mentioned in the introduction, uh, you're not going to get the international tourist impact for these Winter Olympics. So you're going to have to rely much more on domestic tourism and domestic uh, expenditure. But uh, as we know, you know, China's been moving from a nation of shippers exporting around the world to a nation of shoppers. So it's much more focused on domestic consumption and investment. And perhaps uh, the Winter Olympics is symbolic of uh, you know, China's new approach to economic development. Yes, Tim, you know, I also fully agree with you. You know, I study international trade. Um, actually, starting from 2018, and China already shifted the international trade focus from export to two focus to drive, both import and export. And especially earlier this year, in terms of internet, uh, internet economy, uh, China actually focused on the domestic side, okay? So I really fully agree with you that the Winter Olympic, if we look at the economy, you know, it, it actually, you know, go back to Professor Pei just now mentioned the purpose, one important purpose to amend the sports law is to, to you know, encourage the public awareness regarding um, sports, regarding physical education and the relevant facility building. And I will say, you know, it is really impressive that the Chinese government repurpose the beautiful water cube a st a stadium into the ice cube, you know. And I watched the curling games, you know, they're really fantastic. And KG, you know, uh, now let's look at uh, Japan. Um, can you share some insights regarding how the governance of Tokyo Summer Olympics 2020 regarding cost amplification and decision making. All right, thank you. Actually, it's related to uh, uh, Tokyo organizing, uh, Tokyo Olympics organizing committee um, instead of uh, the national government, I think, but uh, okay. Um, the, the original cost of the games, which was estimated to be about 6 billion US dollars, at the bidding stage has grown significantly to $11 billion, according to the estimates of, as of uh, 2019, 2019. Finally, the organizing committee announced at the end of the last year that the total cost was expected to be $12 billion US dollars. On the other hand, some estimates put the total cost at uh, 17 to $26 billion, including other costs related to the games. The final figure of expenses is supposed to be released to the public in June this year. So why did the amount more than double from the original estimate? The first of all, because of the IOC Jap and Japanese people's expectations, the budget tend to be estimated at an initially low level. Otherwise, it would not be accepted by the IOC and Japanese society at first place. Secondly, 
it was not clear who is responsible for any additional cost incurred. The organizing committee has been open regarding the amount of expenses, but not on the details. Due to insufficient external investigation, it was difficult to control the cost increase. The other problems included are, first, the lack of consideration for maintenance costs. The second, the moral hazard of not worrying about the rest of all spending. Third, the lack of interest of Tokyo people regarding the cost of burden. As for the insights, it can be said that the lack of democracy and the transparency regarding the Tokyo Olympics has caused many issues, including cost amplification. Thus, the increased public mistrust on the uh, Olympics itself, uh, uh, although it is very disappointing to me. The, for all the issues that happen in Japan, I would say that the Olympic has been more harmony with authoritative approach than a, a, than a democratic one. In this sense, if the democratic decision-making process permits uh, into the field of Japan, uh, I mean, uh, in the field of the sport in the future in Japan, it will be more difficult to hold the Olympics in Japan again. That's very, how can I say, I have kind of dilemma that I have a mixed feeling, but I think so. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keiji. Um, because there is very limited audience in the two Olympics. So I would say most of people, they are interested in sports like me, I, I watch TV. So, or, or I watch YouTube, you know, the, the, the streaming of uh, the real games. So this implicates a very important intellectual property issue. Now let's go to Professor Pei. So can you share some information on how Chinese government and legislator or law enforcement will protect intellectual property um, amid the Beijing games. So, you know, uh, I just look at our QA's, you know, um, QA board, we have one question. And the question is, is it possible for China changing its zero tolerance policy after the Olympic? You know, I have to say, I'm also very interested in, in this question. You know, currently my mom is with me. Uh, she just want to come back to China. <laughs> but uh, due to the Olympic, the uh, very tight control, she said, OK, I'm going to postpone. And then in March, there is uh, Paralympic Games. And then later, uh, they will have a better idea than me. There is a very important CBT. Uh, CCP uh, big conference again. So, so yeah, so yeah. So how about our, you know, speakers, do you have an idea whether China may, you know, tighten up or maybe um, change his zero tolerance policy after the Olympics? Well, they're not going to. They're not. They're not going to change it during the Olympics, are they? I mean, I, I, I think they're going to be at the moment focused entirely on the next two weeks. And you've seen, uh, you know, the footage from Beijing where they're uh, testing journalists and athletes every day. There's little sleeping booths where where they go, and uh, in in some ways, I think they don't want uh, anything to spoil the spectacle of these games. What they do after the games is a, another matter. And um, in some ways, it buys them a bit of cover. If they do want to slightly change their strategy, they can always you know, blame the pesky foreign athletes for ruining their, their, their COVID zero atmosphere. But uh, I think they'll just be focused on the games for the next two weeks. I fully agree with you. Um, yeah, so really the Olympics is so important. I think in a recent uh, conversation paper published by David, and David also argue that um, and this is very important, uh, you know, a window for China to demonstrate uh, um, 
its success and its economic strength and the political uh, supremacy or et cetera. Yes. Um, my, my another question is, um, is it possible to share notes of Professor Pei's comments? Yeah, I think that's possible. Um, the third question is how will you evaluate the success of an Olympic Boeing court? That is, what factors determine the success or failure of an Olympic Boeing courts? Deb, I, I guess the question is for you. Um, I don't know because I don't know that there have been very, very many successful boycotts. I, I think that um, it's a matter of making views known and then seeing if, if results can be changed. And as I said, in South Africa, that's possibly the one you would describe as the success, but that went on for a long, long time. There were um, uh, trade sanctions, uh, people were held in disregard if they actually went to South Africa. I think there was general agreement that it was time for things to be changed there. Whether there's the same, uh, whether there's the same uh, sentiment internationally in relation to the issues which have uh, raised the political boycott in relation to the games, I think is questionable. So I think that people have made their feelings felt but whether that will end up changing, um, changing uh, the position is is um, is debatable. And I think you know to go back to what um, Tim said, you know the 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 position globally was quite different when the the games were on in two thousand and eight, and I was in and around China at that time, and uh, China was excited about opening up. People were excited about going there. There was a feeling of of a new way of doing things. But I think all of that has dissipated at the moment. And uh, yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. But I suspect that the boycott will have a limited impact for the moment. I think it's interesting uh, what Deb said about South Africa, because it, it, it is true they had a sporting boycott for you know, 25 years or longer. Uh, accompanied with trade sanctions, but it was only really the investment sanctions, particularly Barclays Bank and some major people pulling out of South Africa that put a lot of pressure uh, on the apartheid regime. And it's interesting with sports boycotts because I think the success of the boycott of the Moscow Olympics was only that the LA Olympics got boycotted by the Soviet Union. You know, that was, if you met, if you, if your success is measurement of retaliation, you know, you'll get retaliated against. Well, there's your, there's, your, there's, your, there's your success. And I think it's also quite different in the sense that South Africa didn't have many friends in the world. Uh, it wasn't a major economic superpower, um, you know, that China is now. And, um, you know, there's plenty of people who can point the finger on human rights right, right around the world. So I think it's quite a, a different case in the terms of the economic uh, power of China relative to South Africa under the apartheid regime and the relative isolation that uh, the apartheid regime of South Africa faced globally and within the continent of Africa and indeed within the, the Commonwealth. And, uh, you know, going back to the, the earlier comments and uh, when you compare a tale of two Olympics, I think Deb's right, you know, 2008 was about China and the world. We've arrived. We've, uh, we're now a very successful global player. Well, I think this Olympics is about the domestic economy of China, the domestic population, building up economic sustainability in pockets of China that, you know, that, that still need some, some prosperity, some shared prosperity. And I think that's why they're not too worried about a boycott when it's principally, you know, about, a, about delivering something domestically for the, for the Chinese people. And uh, in any case, it's a bit of a, a soft boycott because it's only the diplomats not going to have cocktail parties at the, at the games. Yes, I fully agree with you and team. So actually I'm very curious, um, KG, uh, you, you know, when, when we discuss uh, Chinese Summer Olympic 2008 or today, the Winter Olympics, we, we, we seem to always consider political issues like uh, to politicize the sports. Um, how about the Japan, um, you, you know, um, What's the original purpose? 
for Japan and Japanese people to apply for the 2020 Summer Games? Is there any political reasons like to show off anything or, you know, those backgrounds? You know, we, we would love to know your insights. Mm, that, I think that's a really good question. Um, it's a many different purpose, actually, the perspectives, you know, from the government, uh, uh, the, you know, Japanese want to, how can I say, the recovered from the uh, Fukushima disaster, I mean, tsunami situation. So that's a very important for all of us to show, you know, the situation to the world. And the other side, that the, we love the Olympics and the philosophy of the Olympics, like an Olympic movement or something like that. Oh, he, he came back, so oh, he, why don't we, you know? Let, oh. let him, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Let's play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you I, I don't know whether I'm back or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so tell us, you know, about, uh, you know, IP issues and also the sports okay. law amendments. Yes. Okay, I, I will uh, just summarize uh, some points of my oh, You uh, have topic. plenty of time. You have plenty of time. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so can I get back to Yes, the... yes. You, you can start okay. from um, uh, physical um, education. Amendment. Yeah, you, you okay, stop okay, at the physical okay. education. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, on physical education schools, recent years have seen the decline of Chinese youth physical quality. Uh, against this problem, the draft confirms that the state gives priority to develop youth sports and promote integration of sports and education. The draft adds several hard provisions to ensure that minors can participate in sports activities sufficiently at school. Thirdly, the draft adds a new chapter on anti-doping, Article uh, 13 of the draft provides that uh, international treaties China has concluded or acceded to have to be reserved. You know, as China is a contracting state of UNESCO anti-doping convention, it has promulgated a series of regulations and rules to implement its obligations under the convention. However, in hierarchy of Chinese law system, uh, regulations and the rules are in a position lower than law. The new chapter summarizes the essence of the above regulations and the rules into sports law and manifests China's determination to combat doping. Um, then about the establishment of sports arbitration system in, in China. Uh, the current sports law stipul stipulates that disputes in competitive sports shall be resolved by sports arbitration institutions but in fact, um, that sports arbitration institutions have never been established in China. And just and the judicial courts are very reluctant to accept and hear sports disputes. Therefore, China has always lacked a dispute resolution for sports. In recent Olympic Games, several professors and lawyers from China have been appointed as arbitrators for the ad hoc division of CAS. Along with reports made by Chinese media on Olympic arbitration and uh, advocation of these uh, Chinese arbitrators, legislators more and more summarize, uh, more and more uh, summarize the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, um, the, along with the reports made by Chinese media on Olympic arbitration and the advocation of these Chinese arbitrators, Legislators more and more realize the importance of sports arbitration. The draft has a specific chapter on sports arbitration with a total of 14 articles, which stipulates that the scope of uh, stipulates the scope of sports arbitration, the establishment of sports arbitration institutions, the qualification of arbitrators, the time limit for arbitration, uh, and the setting aside of arbitration award, etc. This chapter is the largest breakthrough of the revised draft. Till now, the most controversial issue of this chapter is the scope of, arbit of sports arbitral tribunal's jurisdiction. As China has established the commercial arbitration system and the labor arbitration system respectively in the last several decades, the legislators exclude explicitly commercial disputes and labor disputes involving sports elements from sports arbitration so as to ensure that there will be no overlapping on the scope of jurisdiction among commercial arbitration, labor arbitration, and sports arbitration. In a word, according to Article 76 of the draft, 
the sports arbitration institution will only concentrate on doping cases and the disciplinary cases. However, it seems that most scholars and practitioners in China dissent with the legislative logic and the provisions in Article 76 of the draft. Firstly, most countries which have established the sports arbitration system will not intentionally exclude commercial disputes with sports elements from its jurisdiction, but will grant the concerned parties the autonomy to file their case to sports arbitration institutions or commercial arbitration institutions. Secondly, labor disputes in professional football and basketball are most common sports disputes in China. If sports arbitration institutions can't hear these cases, its significance will be much weakened and even its necessity is suspectable. As we know, um, both Australia and Japan have established sports arbitration tribunals to resolve sports disputes. I believe China can learn from these two countries' experiences. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, Perfect. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I will. Mm, yeah, so, so I will switch about my. The... Mm. Yeah, so actually yeah. talk about the arbitration, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think recently and the China international uh, affording related international and trade arbitration commission actually mm -hmm. organized the two or three sports related arbitration yes, webinars, yes. right? To yes, 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 I will be the, I will be the practice, uh, I will participate in the third uh, web uh, webinar of the CTAC. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. You know, please, you know, just keep us informed. I will be very happy to distribute, you know, that webinar sure. information. Sure. Thank you very much. I will uh, switch to the third topic uh, uh, on protection of IP rights in Olympic Games. Um, China's traditional legislation of IP rights, such as the copyright law, the trademark law, the patent law, administrative regulation for special symbols, and the anti unfair competition law can provide protection for the Olympic symbols. Uh, for the purpose of strengthening the protection of our Olympic symbols, safeguarding the lawful rights and interests of the right holders of Olympic symbols, and promoting the development of Olympic movement, China issued and implemented the regulation and the protection of Olympic symbols. It can be safely said that China has now a complete legal system for the protection of Olympic symbols. Olympic symbols are therefore protected by the regulation of protection of Olympic symbols, which includes first IOC symbols, such as Olympic motto, emblem, and anthem. Second, exclusive expression of Olympic movement, such as Olympic, Olympia, and Olympic Games. Third, a symbol of Chinese Olympic Committee. Fourth, the name and symbols of Olympic Games hosted inside China, such as uh, uh, Beijing 2022, etc. Uh, the right holder of Olympic symbols shall enjoy the exclusive rights. Uh, used for commercial purpose must be authorized by the right holders, and the license contract must be signed. Used for commercial purposes uh, means the use of Olympic symbols for profit making purpose. Um, last point is about uh, fighting against uh, ambush marketing. Ambush marketing is a very popular term used in sports industry, but it's now, but it's not a precise legal term. According to Article 6 of the Regulation on Protection Olympic Symbols, the utilization of elements related to the Olympic movement, which might mislead people into believing that there are sponsorship or other support relations between the users and the right holders of the Olympic symbols. Um, may constitute uh, unfair competition and shall be handled in accordance, in accordance with the anti-unfair competition law. But in fact, the object of this article is ambush marketing, even if it does not use this term. However, it must be admitted that in China, there are very few judicial judgments or administrative decisions concerning ambush marketing, while relevant authorities have much uh, have rich experience uh, concerning Olympic symbols infringements. After all, in practice, it's very hard to decide whether an action of ambush marketing 
violates Article 6 or not. Preventing and fighting uh, ambush marketing is really a global problem. In general, I think China has done a good job in protecting Olympic symbols, which fulfills its, prom uh, its promise to IOC and obligation under the host city contract. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are exactly on time. Uh, we already answered all the questions. So just wondering, you know, uh, um, maybe each of our speakers, you can use quickly use one sentence um, to summarize, you know, um, what do you think this Beijing Winter Olympics, Beijing become the first city to host both Summer Winter Olympics, you know, um, also in this very intense geopolitical background. So can you just use one sentence to summarize that you think the most implications of this game? So let's start with Pei. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, you, you know, I, I, I'm living in Beijing now, uh, but I, um, as you all, I will watch the, the enjoy the game uh, by the television. So uh, my wish to the Olympic Games is that it will be uh, peaceful and wonderful. Yeah, that's all my wishes to the Olympic Games. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pei. Um, KG? All right, thank you very much. I hope you know that the uh, uh, Beijing Olympics will be successful and also Olympics will pre uh, prevail over like uh, political issues and other issues. So I hope so. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, very important. You know, I fully agree with you. Yes. Um, Ting? Yeah, well, congratulations to Beijing for holding the Summer and Winter Olympics. And I hope it, uh, it shows that uh, China is part of the world, uh, is a part of the world citizen and, and can go through into the world with, uh, with great Pride and also without without fear, and uh, I hope the athletes are safe and successful. And I hope that we all have a webinar or perhaps in person at the Brisbane 2032 Olympics. So I can see you all again, if not before. Yeah, that will be wonderful. I, I prefer they will be you know in person. In person, be good. <laughs> yes. So you are the last step. Um, well, what I'd say is that it's all about the athletes for me. I'm a sports tragic. I love to watch the events and the athletes to do their best. Um, I've had a lot to do with Olympics and, and organising and around Sydney, and it's a very difficult time. But ultimately, all of that should wash aside and it should be about the athletes. And I wish them all the best for the Olympics in Beijing. Thank you. 